Welcome everyone, this is CSIS 3020 Web Programming and Design. This is the fourth week, second video lecture. So we were seeing some JavaScript samples. Are there any questions so far? So we've seen very simple examples of JavaScript prompting this, presenting this content, alerting, asking for some input. Remember, JavaScript is a programming language capable of calculating stuff. Okay? And we're going to see an example of a class average program. Let's run it. This is what it shows. Enter integer grade. So I type 5. Enter integer grade 10. Enter integer grade 9. 7. 3. 5. 3. 9. 8. 7. Class average is 6.6. .6. How do you accomplish something like that? Well, here's the code. Notice that the body content, all it has is the click, refresh, or reload to start the script all over again. So the entire functionality is in the script tag. What do you do? You declare a whole bunch of variables, the total, the grade counter, the grade, the grade value, average, etc., etc. You initialize total to zero, you grade counter is equal, you start it and initialize it to one. And then you do a while loop. This is how you do a while loop in JavaScript. Very, very similar to Java. You put the condition to keep going into the loop between parentheses, okay, and then the content of the loop will have an open curly brackets and a matching ending curly brackets, and that's what it will loop into. Notice what you do here. You say window prompt enter integer grade, then you put it into this variable. Then you take that grade and you parse it. You parse it into an integer because that's what you're expecting. Okay? So it's going to try to convert whatever that person typed in the prompt and it's going to try to convert it into an integer and put it in here, grade value. And then you add it to a total and then you increment your grade, your counter of grades. When you reach 10, you're done. What do you do with it? You take your total, divide it by 10, and calculate the average and then that's what you put out in the document you say class average is and you concatenate your average very simple stuff so all the calculations that you can do in a regular Java application you can do in JavaScript any questions okay Addition. You can do addition. I'm just going to show you this sample so you see some of the possibilities. I've been I've been good at this, right? I've been telling it first integer integer it's five, second integer seven, the sum is twelve. Very simple stuff, right? Now I'm going to be bad. I'm going to tell it. First integer is Alvaro. And second integer is going to be John. <laughs> what is that? Not a number. Okay? And you also have functions that you can test whether a variable is a number or not. 
Okay, so there is something called is a number and it will respond true or false. What happened there? Well, Alvaro is not a number, right? And if you guys see, enter your first integer, put it into the first number. Then what do you do with first number? You try to parse it into an integer. What's the value of number one? When the initial one was Alvaro? Not a number. It's not zero. Not a number. Okay? Now, if we run it again and we type 5 Alvaro and the second one 7 John it's 12 because first number which was 5 Alvaro it tries to parse an integer out of that in fact if it starts with it with a number it will capture whatever it starts with all the way up to a non-numeric character and it drops everything else just to show you the last time we're gonna type 555 Alvaro 7 and we're gonna type 777 John it took the 555, dropped the 7. It took the 777, dropped the 5. Got it? Alright. You have to know these things because you're going to get into validation later on. Okay. Let's move along into example 05. Okay, so we've seen the while loops. This is an example of the syntax, the very similar syntax to Java or to C, like I said. Notice this, for instance, sum plus equal x. What is that doing? It's taking the value of x and adding it to sum. What is this doing? Plus plus x. It's incrementing x before you, it uses it, right? Basically, what it's doing here is going from 1 to 10 and calculating the sum. That's it. You open with in the browser, sum is 55. Pretty simple stuff. Now let's do it to 100,000. Let's do it to a million. At one point in time, and I don't want to do this because I will be freezing my Eclipse, it will actually freeze your browser. Okay? So you got to be careful with huge amounts. Make sure that they don't freeze your your browser. Okay. Next. O seven. Same thing but with the product. This is all very simple stuff. And example seven. This is an example of an of a conditional with the else. Okay? So you prompt enter a gender, one for a woman, two for a man. You save that gender here and then you say gender if gender equals one. You guys remember the comparison for equality in Java? It's not equal. Equal is assignment. It's equal equal, meaning I really want equal. Right? <laughs> so if gender equals one, you're gonna 
put out in the document woman. Else, you're going to put man. Again, very simple stuff. Doing baby steps here. Okay, so now let's take a look at a second average. This average is a little bit different because I'm going to be able to put as many grades as I want. And the last one will be a minus one, indicating no more grades. This is what is typically called a sentinel, right? For those of you who have seen algorithms, analysis of algorithms. So you can do just three grades. 10, 9, 7, and then a minus 1. The average is 8.6. Okay? You say, that, well, that's the same thing as the other one, right? Well, how about if we run it and we decide we're not going to give any grades? We're going to straight go and do a minus one what is it going to what what is it going to display what's going to be the average no grades were entered this is where you're going to start seeing that javascript has the ability to man not only produce the content but also to manipulate what kind of content you want to show up and how do you how do you accomplish something like that very simple. You have your while loop, right? And you keep reading from the user through the window prompt. Enter the grade, enter the grade until you hit minus one. So as long as the grade is not equal, remember the not equal, exclamation point equal, not equal minus one, what are you going to do? You're going to keep adding, you're going to keep counting the grades, you're going to keep prompting for more grades and parsing them. That's what you're going to keep doing. At the end, when you get a minus one, you have to test whether there was any grades input. How do you, how do you test that? Well, you ask for grade counter not equal to zero, right? If grade counter is not equal to zero, you know that some grades were input. And then you calculate an average. You don't want to end up having no grades and then divide it by zero. What's going to happen when you divide by zero? Eh. And then you're going to say the class average was so and so. But if the great counter is equal to zero, what do you display? No grades were entered. Okay, let's move on. <coughs> What's the next example? Analysis. So we're going to do analysis. What is dip out? Okay. So if we open this one in the browser, it's going to ask, okay, enter one for pass, two for fail. So pass, 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 fail, fail, pass, fail. Okay. Examination results were pass six, fail four. I mean, that's pretty simple stuff, right? You guys know how to do that stuff. Uh, you prone for a one or a two, you put it on the result, and then you ask whether the result was equal to one or two or not. And then you just keep counters for ones and twos. Ones is passes, twos is failures. And then at the end, when the number of passes is greater than eight, which means I won't keep asking you anymore. Oh, I see what it's doing. It said passes. It would just give you the passes, right? But if the number of passes is eight, then we're going to have to raise the tuition. Oh, boy. Look at that. So let's do it again. I had six passes and four failures, right? So I'm going to do now one, two, three, four, five, six, 
seven, eight, nine, and one failure. Notice the notch says nine pass, one fail. We've got to raise the tuition. I don't know what that has to do anything with the tuition, but <laughs> anyway, it's just another example. And then the increment example. This is just very simple stuff. I mean, uh, we shouldn't even have to go. So right now we're covering chapter six and seven. Now we want to get into more complex stuff. So that's chapter eight. Let's look at the wild counter in chapter eight. All right, so now we're using JavaScript to change the style dynamically so that you can change the content dynamically. Let's take a look at it. Whoa! This is done through JavaScript. So you're dynamically changing the font size, right, of your content. Here it is, through the styles. I hate when this stuff goes into more than one line. So basically what you're doing is you're creating a paragraph and a style. The style is a font size and you're putting a counter. And this counter gets incremented. So you're providing a different counter every time. So a different font size every time. Okay, and then you just end the paragraph. Of course, you're also using the counter as part of the content. You're just, you're just, you're showing XML, XHTML font size so and so, with the size EX. So it starts very tiny. One, two, three, four. You get the point. Now, in a similar fashion, just like we have while loops, we also have for loops. And for loops are not like the 6.0 version or 5.0 version of Java. It's the old 1.4 version. Okay? That has changed in Java, but not in JavaScript. The for loops contains three parts. It contains the declaration of the counter, the declaration and initialization of the counter. Then the condition that keeps being tested to to go inside the loop. And then the steps or the increments or decrements of the counter. So in this case we have counter from one, not greater not greater than seven, and we increment counter. And what do we do? Same thing. The same stuff that we did in the while loop. Same stuff that we did here. But we're doing it with a, a for loop. So very simple stuff. Okay. Now we're getting into more dynamic stuff, more code. So if we open it in our Firefox. <laughs> Notice what we're doing here. We're just writing numbers, right? Then a break. Then we write numbers divided by 10 so that's going to show in decimals and a break then we're doing a switch what is a switch anybody
Yeah, it's another conditional testing, but in this case, when you have a specific value, you call it a case. So in case n equals 1, you will execute that, or everything up to the breakpoint. That's what it is. And in case it's 2, now the good thing is that you also have a default, which is in case it's not 1 or 2 or any other value that you had a case for, then it's going to it's going to go into the default. So if you change this to a three, save it, refresh the page. I was going to say the number is not a one or a two. Okay. So you get the point with JavaScript. Very simple stuff. Some interest, all doing, or doing it with for loops and while loops and whatnot. Now, what about more complicated stuff? When you want to do more complicated mathematical stuff, there is another object that you guys are going to need to know very well and it's called the math object. The math will do all kinds of mathematical and um, all kinds of mathematical and statistical analysis. Okay? So just to show you all the didn't do it this time. <laughs> Maybe because the, it was already there. Let me see. Let's try it again. Math dot. Oop. You know why? It didn't do it? Because I'm in notepad. <laughs> That's not good. I have to be in Eclipse. Okay, let's do it again. Math dot. Look at these. Square root. A cosine. A tangent. Exponential. Cosine. Floor. Logarithmic. Max. Minimum. Power. Random. Generate random numbers. The square root. The sine. The tangent. Okay. Alright, so in this case, what are we doing with interest? We're calculating the interest on a thousand dollars for several years. See this? This is all, it's a table, right? How do we generate a table? It's a table. Here it is. Document, right line, table, caption, table header, and the table data. So you're starting to see how you can produce every single content that you can produce in HTML. You can drive it from JavaScript. Okay? Because in essence, what you're doing, and let's take a look at the table that was created. If we take a look at the table that was created in here, all this table, table header, table rows, all these table rows are generated by JavaScript document write lines. Even though when you go and look at the source, there is no indication that that was JavaScript. Okay. All right. Are there any questions? 
So I want to. I'm going to let you guys go through the rest of the samples. They're pretty simple examples. The switch test, the dual wild test, the break test, the continue test. You know, you can declare labels, which I don't suggest declaring labels because that that's a mess. You can turn into go tos and turn into this spaghetti code. JavaScript can turn into spaghetti code. Really bad documented spaghetti code, which is not a good idea. Okay. <coughs> so let's move on into more complex ones, the JavaScript functions. So now let's go into and dive into the JavaScript functions. So, like I said, we have under the math, we have the square root. Oh, in this case, it's the square, I'm sorry. Not the square root, it's the square. So, the square of 7 is 49, of 8 is 64. How do you do that? Well, you declare a loop. You declare a function. Oh, how do you declare functions in JavaScript? How do you declare your own function? Suppose that there's a function that you need to calculate something that it's not available in the math or anywhere else. This is how you do it. Notice that inside the script you have code that gets executed, right? But anything inside function or procedure will not get executed until it's called. That's why this code will never touch square until it gets here. This is how you call square. So square and then you pass a parameter x. So very quickly the browser is going to go, oh it's calling square, let me see where it's square and it's going to go through all the JavaScript until it finds a function with the same name and the same number of parameters what is typically called the signature of the function name and number of parameters okay and then how do you return something in the function well you have similar to java you say return and then whatever you return it, a variable some kind of formula whatever some kind of value. Notice that functions do not have return types as in Java. Why? Because JavaScript is typeless. JavaScript is typeless. Inside X you can put a date, an integer, a string, whatever, and JavaScript is going to take it. Is that good or bad? What do you guys think? A variable that accepts everything. It's good, right? You like it. <laughs> it's like everything in life. The more freedom you have, the more responsibility you have. Okay? When you have a variable that accepts any type, you have a lot of power. You have a lot of freedom. But guess what? You also have a lot of responsibility. Because when you assign something to the variable, at one point in your code, you have to know exactly what that value is. Otherwise, when you try to manipulate it, your code will not work at all. If you try to treat an integer as a date, or as an object, something, you know? So... It's good. As long as you know uh, how to respond, um, treat responsibly. Random it, random int. This is how you clear random numbers. Look at this, this is pretty cool. Math, random, 
and it will give you a number between 0 and 1. Right? But what you want is not a zero between it's not a number between 0 and 1. What you want is a number between 1 and 6. So you modify it by multiplying it by 6 and then adding 1 and then taking what it's called a floor. The floor is the least the integer closest to the amount. Right? Remember this number is going to give you decimals. The math floor will give you just an integer. So look at this. You are creating a table of numbers randomly. You want to see that? Memorize the first row. They're all random. So every time you refresh the page, a different table gets generated. How did it do that? Math random. Okay? So you are creating the table, you are creating the TD every time. Okay? Now, can anybody explain to me how do you get the different rows? You are producing five numbers at a time and then you're going to the next row another five and then to the next row another five how do you do that? guys familiar with mod? modular? modular? in JavaScript, like just like in Java the modular of a number is the percent sign so if this is 11 what is 11 modulo 5? 1. It's the remainder after a number divisible by 5. So, if the modular of this number, modulo 5 of this number is equal to 0, okay, that means you're done with the first row. 5 numbers. So it's time for you to create a new table row. How do you do that? And the previous table row and add another table row. Where did we start the previous row? Right here. So you're starting to see the mess that we can come up with. HTML code, JavaScript, HTML code, JavaScript, and a whole bunch of, you know, it's a mix of HTML and JavaScript. Okay. And we're going to keep doing this until we hit 20. When we hit 20, that's it. No more. Okay. Let's go into something more interesting. Roll the die. Look at this. The browser just rolled the die. 6,000 times in a matter of a second. Basically what it did, it generated a number between 0 and 1 and then you multiply by 6 and add 1 and then grab the floor and it gives you a, a number between 1 and 6. That's basically what happened. But it did it 6,000 times. And it kept record on how many times it, fall, it fell on 1, how many times it fell on 2, just like the die. Look at this. Frequencies. A lot of fives. Let's roll the die again. 6,000 times. 
a lot of force. A lot of force. And you can guess pretty much how this this one works, right? You have frequencies, variables, and you have a phase value of the die, right? And then what do you do? You have a for loop of 6,000 times, right? 6,000 rolls. And in each roll, you get a number. It's a random number, which you put it in the phase. And then you use a switch. Notice this example. I mean, we're trying, we're starting to get all these different concepts together, working together. You know, conditional, switch, uh, variables, math, object, etc. Switch, phase. In case it's a one, you update the right frequency. A two, the right frequency. And then at the end, what do you do? You create a table with table rows. Would you just show the die face? That's hard coded. With its frequency. See that? That's how you get that table. In fact, the JavaScript can become as complex and as interesting as a game. Have you guys played games in JavaScript? Have you seen any JavaScript? It's actually web pages that you go and it downloads the entire JavaScript into the page and executes and the, and the execution of the page is a game. Anybody have played craps? <laughs> it's kind of the rules are kind of difficult, right? So you roll the dice. Die one came as one, die two came as two, the sum is three. The player loses. The idea is when you roll the two dice, what what is it gonna add? It they should add to seven, right? I think. And as long as you keep doing that, you win. 7 or 11 on the first one. So I'm going to roll the dice. Here we go. 5. Roll again. 6. Roll again. 5. Player wins. We'll have to get the rules for craps. <laughs> I'm not even sure what the rule is. I thought it was 7. Oh, okay. So if you roll on the first one, you lose. <laughs> See, that's what I'm saying. It's really complicated rules. <laughs> Right, right. You can get it through what? One, six, two, five, three, four, right? And the elevens are what? Just six fives? Just six fives. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so we're actually playing crap. Craps. So, I guess we will have to know the rules so we can actually look at the code, right? 
I mean, that's the whole idea about being a programmer. You have to know how it's supposed to work before you actually put it in code. So, since I don't know what the rules are, I'm going to leave it up to you guys to go through that code. <laughs> but you were right. Look at this. Case 7 or 11, right? In, in, in those cases, win on first row. So there is a game status that keeps what's the status on the game, right? And the sum of the dice. Now if it's 2, 3, or 12, it loses on the first row. And if not, you can continue rolling the dice, right? Until what? That's what I'm not... Oh, lose by rolling a 7. Okay. So you lose by rolling a 7. So, do you guys see how complex the JavaScript can get? I mean, we started with one or two lines of JavaScript, right? Now we're into a hundred lines of JavaScript code. This craps game, it's a hundred lines. Now, very interesting question. How do we get the whole thing? Because so far what we've seen is we load the page and since the JavaScript is there in the in the header, it, it executes it. But in this case, we do not want it to execute until we click the button. How do we accomplish that? Look at this. You guys remember what a button was? It's an input tag, right? In, fa in fact, a button is an input tag of type button. And it could also be of type submit, which is the one that you use to send information to the, to the server, right? But in this case, it's just a plain button. It also has an attribute called onClick. And in fact, you want to see all the different attributes? I'm in the wrong place. I'm in Notepad again. <laughs> This is craps. Craps. Oh, great. I don't have craps yet in here. So let's copy and paste it in here. Look at this button. This button which is an input tag, can have all these attributes. Notice that there is a whole bunch of them that start with the word on. On blur, on change, on double click, on focus, on key down, on key press. These are attributes that have the name of an event that happens to the tag. And sometimes you want to be able to capture these events and do something about it. So, in the case of when you click on it, there is, guess what? You guessed it. There is an unclick which is basically saying this is an, an, a button, it's an input tag but I want to do something when this button gets clicked so you give a, a value to the unclick attribute and what's the value of the unclick attribute? play open parentheses close parentheses which you should already know by now that's how you call a JavaScript function correct? Somewhere in this JavaScript, we, we're going to be able to find a function called play with no parameters. So let's go back 
here it is function play so when this button gets clicked it will run function play which as you can see is pretty much the entire code in this page except for what except for the declaration of the variables play is well not really it's up to here and then there's another function called roll dice up to here and that's the end of the script right so when this button gets clicked play will execute that's how you get the JavaScript to execute not only when you run the page when you load the page but when you click whoa I'm winning big time <laughs> too late okay Now look at this random picture. Every time that I load the page, a different image shows up most of the time. Okay? Same kind of concept. We right? How many images do we have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven images. Let's create a random. Let's get let's generate a random between one and seven, right? And then create an image whose H which, whose source SRC equal to that number, that GIF. Notice, notice that all these are GIFs. One GIF, two GIF, three GIF. Right? Let's see if we we're good at this. Yes, look at this. Every time that the page loads, 